Good morning everybody. Welcome to our family service. And before we start looking at these verses in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, I'd like just to open our time with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the privilege of coming round your word this morning. Uh, and our deep desire is that you may speak to our hearts. We pray that you will encourage us, lift us up, speak to us, no matter what our circumstances, we desire to meet with you this day. And so please help us now in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, I don't know whether you uh, watch Songs of Praise, but um, a few weeks ago, I was looking at uh, the programme uh, and it was coming from uh, Formby Beach, which is near Liverpool. Uh, and on that particular beach, there are uh, figures of men uh, made out of iron. They're called the Iron Men of Formby Beach. And the interviewer was speaking to the person who had created uh, these uh, Iron Men. And, and they're positioned on the beach, staring out to sea. And the interviewer was uh, asking the uh, sculptor, um, what he had meant to uh, convey uh, by positioning these men looking out to sea. And he said that he just wanted to convey the idea of people straining out to sea to see what lay beyond the horizon. And I guess there are many people uh, in today's uh, topsy-turvy world who are wondering what lies beyond the horizon. This pandemic is a very traumatic time for many people. Uh, with the death of, of loved ones uh, because of COVID-19 and uh, loss of jobs, unemployment, the breakdown of relationships, the very real prospect of many business people facing bankruptcy, to say nothing of the fragile character of many of the institutions that we've come to rely on as being unshakable and yet now they are very fragile and so many people are wondering what does lie beyond the horizon and so with all of this I want to welcome everyone here today who will be listening to this message especially if you're troubled uh, in today's world maybe you're worried uh, about what may lie beyond the horizon for you. And so as I've wondered about this uh, service this morning and prayed about it, uh, I've decided to give it the title, God's Wonderful Grace. Because when I was reading my Bible uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I came across this passage in Ephesians chapter two, the first 10 verses. And after I'd read them, I put my Bible down and I exclaimed, what a wonderful God I have. What a great, glorious God we have. And grace is a word that is very rarely used uh, in today's language. We're more familiar with the word mercy, particularly in the, in the Christian context. But as far as grace is concerned, it's a word that is very rarely used uh, in today's world. Now, some people have described the meaning of grace in the Christian context as saving us from what we deserve. Mercy has been described as saving us from what we do deserve, which is God's punishment because of our sinful condition and because of our sins. But grace has been described as saving us from what we deserve, giving us what we don't deserve. Now, what is it that we do deserve as sinful people? Well, we deserve God's judgment because God's word says that all people have disobeyed God from Adam down to the present day. We've all been born and made in sin and that is our innate character is to be disobedient towards God. So nobody can ex escape uh, that description of what we are. 
But the great thing is that God's grace uh, overshadows all of that. And God is offering us something that we don't deserve. And so as we look at these verses, uh, do please follow them. Uh, follow them in your Bible or on your Bible app. You know, I, I'm sometimes disappointed when I come to church and I, I see folk turn up without a Bible or without the Bible app on their phone. And I think, you know, you must be all at sea because you can't follow what the speaker is saying. So I would encourage you, if it's your habit, to come to Bible, to, to come to church rather, without a Bible or without the app on your phone to do so in future because it's a great help to follow the passage through verse by verse. And so let's look at the first verse in Ephesians chapter 2. And what is Paul saying here? He's speaking to people who were from Ephesus, the Ephesians, and he was writing to them. And these people were people just like us, with the same passions, the same feelings, the same temptations. And he's reminding them of what they were like before they came to faith in Christ. And as you read it, you might say, well, what on earth is Paul saying? He seems to be contradicting himself because in one minute he's saying they were dead. They were once were dead. But then he's speaking about them as walking and following and living. How can these things be? How can people who are dead actually walk and follow? Well, what his meaning is this. He's saying that before they came to Christ, that's how they were as far as God was concerned. They were dead because they were following the course of this world. It's a very vivid illustration of what we were like before we came to Christ. I don't know whether you've ever um, looked out of a, a window when you've been in an aeroplane and looked down and seen a meandering river. As it winds its way and twists this way and that way uh, into the horizon, you, you, you look down on this river and, you know, that is a picture of what Paul is saying here today. He's speaking about those who follow the course of this world. In other words, it's as if they can't help but follow the course of this world because of their condition as being outside of Christ before they came to faith. Dead means absolutely no response. I don't know whether you've ever seen a dead person. I have. Uh, I remember seeing my own father lying dead in his bed. Uh, somebody I loved and cherished very dearly. And yet there he was, somebody I loved, but absolutely without a spark of response. And that is what Paul is reminding the Ephesians here, that that's what they were like before they came to faith. They were spiritually dead. There was no response to God. J.B. Phillips describes it as living blindfolded in a world of disillusion. And the world, sadly, is full of dead people walking around. But then Paul goes on to say that they were once children of wrath. Uh, if you look at verse 3, he says they, they were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In other words, unless they turned away from their sinful lives, they would come under God's terrible judgment. And you know, this is something that those of us who have a responsibility to preach God's word, and it is a responsibility and a great privilege, but we need to warn people about the judgment that's coming because God is a holy and righteous judge and he must judge sin finally. He must judge this world finally. And whatever he does, he'll do out of his love. He must do because that's his character. You might say, well, I thought God was a God of love. But so he is. But his character is one of holiness. 
And so this is why it's my joy this morning to speak about God's wonderful grace. Now I've been outlining what Paul has been describing to the Ephesians, what they were like before they came to Christ. And if you're listening this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus, then sadly what I've been saying is your position before God. We cannot minimise the urgency of the moment. We have a responsibility to be faithful to God in his word. But then look at verse 4. Two fantastic words. But God. What about him? What about God? Well, it tells us, first of all, that he's rich in mercy. This is the God that we delight to preach, is a God who is rich in mercy. But why is he rich in mercy? There must be a motive, a reason for that. It's because of his great love for us. That's where we see his grace is in his love. And how did he love us? Well, he loved us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. When there was no response to God whatsoever, God loved us you see it means that he loved us without a reason to we love generally we love as husbands as fathers as friends or whatever we tend to love because somebody loves us in return there's a reason to love them or may we love them because naturally we like them i have a very dear wife and i love her because she loves me I love her because of who she is, but I also love her because she loves me. But God loves us when there was no basis for him to do so. Our sins have separated us from God. That's the serious situation. And if we're dead, there's only one doctor that can help us, and that's God himself. John 3.16 gives the remedy offers the remedy God sent his only son that whoever and as many have said before you can insert your own name there God sent his son only son that if Mark believes in him will not perish that means have eternal death will not perish but instead will have eternal life but what do I have to do well I have to do something I have to believe and that includes repentance. It means that I say to God with genuine godly sorrow that I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed. I'm sorry for what has come in between me and him. And the wonderful message is this, that Jesus suffered in your place and my place on the cross. He poured out his precious blood An offering that God could look at and say, that's righteous, I'll accept that. And he did that on our behalf. What a saviour we have. He's a substitute, God's substitute, sent from heaven for you and me. But what we need to do is, we need to express a genuine, heartfelt sorrow to God for our sinfulness and our disobedience. Well, you say, well, well, is that it? Is that all? But no, there's more. You see, look at verse 6. Not only uh, has God um, offers Christ to us, he's made us alive together. Once we were dead, uh, in verse 1, we were described as being dead, but now we've been made alive. All because of God's grace. As it says in verse 5, even when we were dead, In trespasses, God has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Yes, there's more than just meeting our sinful condition. We've been made alive in Christ and we've been raised up together with him. A new person before a holy God, justified forever, made right forever, You know, that's an important thing that we Christians need to take to heart. 
that we've been justified. It's not something that we dip into and then fall out of, and then dip into again and fall out of. Regardless of how we feel, we are justified before God because of the precious blood of Jesus. Now, we need to get that solidly into our heart. And if you're a young Christian today, young in the faith, embrace that. Ask the Holy Spirit to make that real to you, that you are a justified person because of your reliance on the blood of Jesus and God looks upon you as being right. Maybe I, I will look the same outwardly. Well, I would look the same outwardly. Maybe with the same grey hair or whatever. But as a person, you are justified before God. Because your affections have been changed. And that's called conversion. And so we're a new person. We've been raised up with him. It's not like a, a patched up old car. Sometimes when I'm driving around, you'll see an old motor car with maybe the door is a different colour or the wing on the, on the front of the car is a different colour to the rest of the body and it looks a bit patched up. Is that what God does with us? Does he just patch us up and make a bit of a, a botched up job? No, he doesn't. Paul could say, I have being crucified. That old nature that derives from Adam has been nailed to the cross and is gone. God has finished with me, you could say, because he started anew and he's raised us up with him and seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, is that all? Well, it's not. This is what God has done in Christ. He's seated us with him in heavenly places. It doesn't say that he's going to do it. It says that he has done it. He's raised us, past tense. It's something that he has done. Seated means I'm in a settled place. I've taken possession of something. When you came into the church this morning... You sat down on that chair and you kind of took possession of it. It's your chair. You're sitting on it for half an hour or an hour or whatever it may be. It's your chair. Well, that's the idea here, that we've been seated in heavenly places. God has given you a place before him in Christ and it's yours to take possession of. And this is something that he's done. It's remarkable, isn't it? God's grace, no wonder we can call it God's wonderful grace. But then, what has motivated God to do this? If you look at verse 7, it says this, So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Did you know that God is kind? The scripture, scripture speaks of the kindness of God, the goodness of God, leading people to repentance. It's when the, the goodness of God dawns on the human heart that you feel that you've got to do something about it. And repentance is the product of that. But it's immeasurable. It's without limit, without bound, this grace that God gives and we cannot appreciate it with being out without being moved in our hearts towards God. Now, there have been times during this lockdown when, personally, I've longed to engage with Christ. Simply because I felt the isolation uh, of being without fellowship with God's people, the singing of songs together, praying together, sharing God's word together looking upon those that I love, and it's tough, very real. And I've longed to engage with the person of Christ. Well, Christ is the object for our hearts. Has he engaged your heart? Has he? Or is he just a, a person in the distance, as it were, like those iron men on that beach in Formby, straining out to sea, 
something beyond the horizon? Or is Christ the object of your heart? There's a concern to take our church forward. We've considered a new name for the church, and that's been decided upon. But changing the name in itself is not going to take the church forward. What is going to change the, take the church forward is Christ living in our hearts, that people will see Christ in us, and that is how the church is going to meet, move forward. And so we need to have Christ as the object of our hearts. And those of us who have the responsibility and privilege to speak in the church must lift Christ up as the object of our hearts. But then look at verse 8. Once again, Paul refers to God's grace. It's as if he's saying, don't you dare forget the basis on which all of this has given to you. It's God's grace. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this has nothing to do with you, Ephesians. It's all of God. Don't let's forget that we, we're not entitled to any of these things. God's grace is free, perfect. Oh, the grace of God is boundless. It's perfect, full and free. And then finally, as we look at verse 10, we're described as being God's workmanship. In verse 1, we were told that we were dead. Now, Paul is telling them that they're God's workmanship. You know, next time you come into the church, into our new building, don't just focus on the bricks and mortar, lovely though it is. I've been in there and had a look round and it's great. But don't just focus on there. Instead, have a good look round at the people sitting there. They're God's workmanship, warts and all. They're God's workmanship. They may not seem like it from the outside, but in Christ, they're God's workmanship. And you cannot improve on God's workmanship. You know, when I was at school, we were taught about superlatives. Good, better, best. I hope I've got this right, but I think the word best is the superlative. It cannot be improved upon. And that is how God operates, that what he does cannot be improved upon. It's the best. And we are God's workmanship created in Christ. What for? For good works. We're saved to do good works. We're not saved by good works. It's tragic, the numbers of people that think by doing good works, charity work, so-called professing Christians, and that's all they are, professing Christians, think by doing charity work, will curry with God. Well, it won't. But we have been saved, created to do good works so that God's wonderful grace might be seen in us and that others might be drawn to him. So may God encourage us during this time of lockdown. We all need a, 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 an uplift, don't we? And Christ is the answer. And before I uh, close this time with prayer, I just want to read a lovely old hymn that I came across the other day. And I'd like you just to listen to the words. And then after that, I'll pray uh, and our service is over. But the hymn goes like this. O Lord, what love for sinners thou hast shown to give thy life for those by sin undone. But is that blood which doth for sins atone for me? Was it for guilty sinners such as I that thou, O Lord, did suffer here to die? And is that grace which thou dost now supply for me? Is it for me who early went astray, who turned from God to tread a self-willed way? Is it for me that mercy flows today for me? If it's the hopeless case thou lovest to meet, 
If it's a sinner thou dost run to greet, then tis for me to worship at thy feet for me. Yes, t'was for me, Lord Jesus, thou didst come. To me thou givest pardon, peace and home. And Saviour, in thy loving heart, there's room for me. Shall we just pray? Dear God and Father, we thank you for your wonderful grace. I just pray that our hearts will be touched afresh by this today so that we may be changed people, radiating features of the Lord Jesus, that we may be able to tell others, that others may see the change in us, that we might be lights in this dark world. And so as a fellowship of your people, we're a bit scattered at the moment. Some are in the church and some are at home. But wherever we are, I pray that we may be encouraged this morning. For your praise and glory, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.